Joe. Oh, yeah. If you need it, I'll lay it down. Then we can talk, okay? I just want to go. Just a wee bit. I uh, usually put crazy glue on my fingers to hold the picks on. And it takes me a while. Sometimes I forget. I can't get them off easy. And I have to sleep with them and my husband wakes up screaming. <laughs> and I turn I want to be ashamed. <laughs> well, I do. I use crazy glue. Can't get my fix off. Is that okay? Does it sound all right to you? All right, just a minute. I got knots on my fingers, see? So the picks don't go up far enough, so I have to put crazy glue. Look how much crazy glue is stuck in there and skin. <laughs> Gotta do it very carefully. What's the matter there? She wants to be loved. Do you want to be loved? You want to sing for me? You going to sing some bluegrass? You squirrely dog. Here. That's the first time she's ever done that. Oh, <laughs> you little sticker, you like bad joke music, you hate it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> now you go far and take her. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, do I hurt your ears or do you like it? Or do you hate it? Do you hate banjo? Pick, uh, run quickly. I hear banjo music. <laughs> Is that what you're saying, you old tinker? I love you, little pumpkin. You love me too. Yes, I gotta do. take her inside before oh, she yeah. ruins it. Oh, honey, she can ruin it. He's a no. bless it's hard. She's Go making she it better. The huh? She was enjoying sometimes. it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <I> yeah. <laughs> Good okay, stuff, huh? did you get that? <laughs> yeah, we got it. Okay, well, I can play it now. Come on, baby. That's right. Barbara, go put this on the couch. Oh, okay. Put your hand under here, too, honey. It's heavy. Okay. All right, go with go on, with first. You've got the banjo. He likes the banjo, evidently. Oh, yeah. Oh. I don't blame him. I didn't I didn't know that dog was that crazy to like a banjo. <laughs> Charlie, that's cute. That was perfect. I got up this morning and I said, well, I'm going to color my hair. Because someone said, hey, Ronnie, is that your real color? And I said, yes, yeah, see? <laughs> I do that on stage, so silly stuff. But I like to be silly. It's kind of fun. It makes people smile. Okay, I don't care if they think I'm crazy or what, but whatever it is, I like it. Well, yeah. I like to do it. Okay, now, what do you want to ask, Pumpkin? Um, well, I, I want to ask, ask it. Ask a few different things. Maybe we could start with, um, you know, one of the things that I. Getting chilly out here. I really, um, yeah, it's too okay. cold. No, huh? That's all right. Um, that I want to talk about was, uh, okay. you know, what we were talking about in the car. Um, there's a lot of creativity in making show. A making show or yeah. making a up a show? You mean learning to play and doing it and. Well, making the, a show? The, the opposite or the other side of what bluegrass people don't do. Oh, bless their hearts. Sometimes I worry about the young people. They get up there and they're zombies. And, and after all, it's just fun. If, blue, if, if bluegrass music or mountain music isn't fun, well, she's an if bluegrass or mountain music isn't fun, then I say don't play it. Go somewhere else. I see you got my itinerary. You can put the camera, put the camera on it. That'd help you. Let me get over here so I can see you and talk to you. And you all can put the same it underneath time. your. Well, underneath the foot. This is. Uh, I was just gonna hold it up oh, so we okay. can put it on here real quick. Let's all right. see here. We got Dublin. Is that Dublin, Ireland? Uh -huh. I'm going to oh. Dublin, Ireland. And Cork. And Tipperary, I don't even know where that is. It's a long, it's, a, it's in Ireland. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. World War One, too. That's great. I can't wait to go there. No kidding. I'm getting excited. Yeah, I've never been over there. Mm -hmm. so, 
Now, you wanted to know what we were talking about, about the young people playing their bluegrass music and stuff? Yeah, it's like they, they learn to play music a little bit, but then that's as far as their showmanship goes. Maybe because they don't know how to create that energy or create the 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 mindset or the or they don't, they don't think it's important a lot of them unfortunately Bill Monroe I guess was the one who it always stood still and he could fire anybody who smiled in his band did you know that oh yeah he'd fire we always we used to laugh at that the Stonemans would show up to where Bill Monroe was playing we were playing there too like a festival or something and we'd sit and watch him, but every one of his band just stood there like a zombie. They couldn't smile. And I went over to one of them, and he got off the stage. <clears throat> and I said, how come y'all don't move around? He said, Bill Monroe, he said, Bill don't want us to smile. So I got tickled. I said, I guess it's because, you know, maybe some of his bands had bad teeth. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't do that. No, I don't mean that. That's just funny, I think. Anyway, back in the old days when people used to take pictures, you know, they were still pictures like my grandpa's picture. They were just... Right. A lot of them had bad teeth. Right. And that was caused a lot by the water. Hmm. It had no fluoride in it. Oh, right. No, right. no fluoride at all. So, to me... But no nowadays they got so many microphones. They put, like if you have a 15-piece band, just say if and you did. They got 15 microphones, and everybody stood right in front of it. And they didn't move because then they couldn't be heard. But if you had two, they'd have to learn to move in and out. You know, like, that's the way you had one. And Scott would say, now get in that microphone and get out. He said, when it's, you get in there, let them know. You know, be be forceful. Like, just, you know, the other step back, that's the way it is with the family. Um, yeah. Nowadays, guys say, what are you trying to do, take my mic? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and there's a lot of jealousy of bluegrass. Uh, used to be, I guess it still is. I'm very sorry about that. Oh gosh, how many times we, the Stonemans disgusted that. Because we were not jealous over each other. Scott used to say, I don't care who gets the applause, just get it. And that, that's uh, real entertainers. The ones who are not jealous over each other. Scott used to say, Ronnie, if you find somebody who can pick better, you follow them around and get to be their friend. And he said, because they're probably going to the top as top as they can go. And he said, you can learn from them too. But he never told me to be jealous over this one or that one. Because it was all about. Now, I'm going to tell you a story that I've never told anybody. And some of your friends or fans might not like this. But it's the truth. At least that's what an agent told us. We were to do a show. I think it was 26 shows. I think it was. Now, don't hold me to that number. But it was a tour. Joe Taylor Artist Agency was booking this show. It was a tour, you know, for bluegrass and festivals and everything. And Bill Monroe found out that we were going. He was on the show, too, along with several others, other bluegrass, you know, bands. And he went and told this, the guy called us in, his office, the agent. And he said uh, to us, you can't go. And we needed that job so we were so down on our finances. It was time, really hard times then. And he said, if you, Bill Monroe says, if the Stonemans go, he's not going. Well, needless to say, Bill Monroe had the bigger name, you know, because he was Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. But we were show people, and we got the applause. So he didn't particularly like playing with someone who got, and I mean it, gang, I ain't lying, okay? It's not fun playing with a band of musicians when you're the king, so-called king of bluegrass. And the, uh, we never did hold it against Bill, but we sure did need that money in that tour. But when he was uh, in the nursing home and he was in severe bad shape, Donna, my sister, is a minister. She went over there and ministered to him, and he accepted Christ again. And tears, he told her to play as Manlin sitting there in the corner.
And she got over there and she played for him and she did a gospel song. And he was always, you know, not, he didn't, he would always watch Donna, but he never did comment, you're good. Bill Monroe was never that type of a feller. He'd come over and say, boy, I sure like your picking. Unless she was a girl bass player. <laughs> oh, well, I shouldn't say that. But I think that's fine. <laughs> I'm not bad about it, anybody. I'm just telling you how it is. Am I doing bad? I'm telling things out of school I shouldn't tell. But anyway, uh, if you was a girl bass player, he, he would follow you around, I guess, if you thought he needed one. He always had some girl playing the bass. And it's usually a blonde. That's why I did my hair blonde for Bill. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> no. <clears throat> they used to, I would play. I played with the family all so long. Then I started playing on my own when I became a sex symbol on Hee Haw and doing the ironing board skit. <laughs> I was really the sex symbol. Yeah, right. I, my measurements were 9, 10, 11, but I carried that 40-pound badger on my neck. <laughs> I'm having to go to chiropractors today because of it, part of it anyway. Because it'll sure around your neck. So was Bill nice to Donna when, when she was playing the gospel mail for her? He cried. Before, oh. Tears was running down his, his... Donna said the pillow got wet from his tears, and she got up and wiped his tears for him and prayed with him. Now that's, that's a Christian. That's a Christian way to do, isn't it? Bill Monroe, he sung a lot of Christmas and gospel, Christian songs and gospel, but I never heard him talk much about it. Of course, he wasn't much of a talker. He had told me one time, I'm on a stage, and he told me, he said, you got some good looking yams. And I didn't know what a yam was. I thought, what's that? <laughs> it sure ain't the arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> he met my legs. I, that was found out. Am I doing bad? You you're, can't erase anything. You're you're doing great. I'm a, I, I'm gonna try like like in in the movie. There's no no talking to me. Like no no like none of my laughing. So like if, if you think I'm not, oh. I, I'm trying to hold back a little bit okay. so I don't I don't get on too much audio on the oh, well, on your me. on your parts. <laughs> um, you Are know. you gonna fire me? <laughs> 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 I love you. Never. Two hands. You Never. should be in a thing in a movie or whatever you're doing. Oh, you're sweet. No, I'm serious. No, you're doing it's a heart great. Attack. You're doing great. Okay. This is this is fun. So just, just <laughs> wherever it goes, that's where we'll go. I have a lot of things to say. <laughs> well, we talk but, about you know, whatever. You I want. was so proud. Donna said, "Ronnie, I went over to see Bill today, and he cried. He said we talked about the Lord and accepting Christ as your Savior." And he told me to play the mandolin. I sung some of his gospel songs and played one of his tunes, and some of his tunes, and he cried like, he said the tears was just going down his cheeks and she went over and wiped his tears away. There ain't many people can say that. I don't know of anybody else who did. Me neither. Yeah, God love him. We all love Bill. We got a kick out of his musician standing there like a, like a zombie. They should have been in the zombie movie. <laughs> it's it's pretty strange how 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 stilted they can be. Not 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 even move their mouths or when they sing. To. He did. The boy said, "Yeah, if uh, oh, I know one of the the bluegrass boys. His name is Dane Dana." Oh yeah, Dana Cup. I love him, and we and him talk about it, and he'll say, "And here's Bill Murray." Just 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 keep it. I'm just play it right, and he can mix. <laughs> he bought Bill. He said, now don't smile. And Bill, let me tell you what else he did. It was funny. Now, to me, it's funny. There's stories out, okay? It's like war stories to each other. And nobody is bad-mouthing the other one. This way the old school used to be. They would talk about the other one, but it's a funny thing they did. And it would keep their name going. You know, Scott says, don't get out there and be goody two-shoes, Ronnie, because people don't like anything you've done good. You gotta make up stuff and do stuff. So they'll say, did you know what that Scott Stoneman said? You know what he did? You know. And so it's the way it was then. It was fun to play and be around your peers and cause then you can watch their little moods and their ways and then get a kick out of it. And so, and, and, and how- Music was fun. Right, right. And that, that's what translates to the, the audience, the fun, the fun stuff. Now I didn't see that in Branson. Branson is awful for that. Branson ought to have somebody go in there and kick every one of them young people's butt because they're so backbiting. It's terrible. I mean, they, they're serious as a heart attack with their music. Music is, our music, I've been around it, 
God, 70 years I've been on stage, my dear, 70 years. So you see, I've seen a lot of changes in people's personalities, which people always say that crazy, Ronnie, she don't think anything. But trust me, I do. But I don't know why people can't, you know, when you have a festival, that the musicians should be friendly to each other and go over there and tell war stories of the road, of what's happened to them, how many times they got stuck in the mud with their old buses, how many times did they didn't get paid, how many times, and who did what to them. And we used to have, it's almost like a movie. I would love to do a movie on that how it used to be so you can show the young people how to be and how to truly in their soul to enjoy their music and not take it so seriously because we all live and die next one day you're happy and you're healthy and the next minute you go Ugh, i hope my hand will work when i pick and they have to push up there in the stage with a wheelchair what do you think it is that changed how do because they're young and they don't know what's going on. They, the young people, even the teenagers and young people in school today are jealous over each other. They're jealous over the hairdos. Well, we were so poor, we didn't have shoes. And I went to school in Maryland. They call me that bow-legged, knock knee to hillbilly. <laughs> I didn't care. And they call me that retarded hillbilly when I started learning my banjo that Daddy made with the three-finger roll. Yep. So where did y'all, how, how did you start to develop and create the show that... That we did? That, because it was such son, you know... Scott um, was awesome, yeah. Um, between the, the, between the, the comedy and the energy and like... Well, like just was, like doing it now. People want to be talked to. They want to be loved. They want to feel like part of your show. And, and that's, that was so many of us, we had an audience all our life. And we had critical criticism to each other. And Scott would say, now, Ronnie, you didn't get that role right. You didn't get this and you didn't get that. And I'd try to do it right. Then he'd say, yeah, you did all right. <laughs> Can I tell you a story about Scott? All right, we were playing at Barry, uh, was it right on the Shenandoah River. It was a big festival one year. Berryville. A long time ago. Berryville. Berryville. Yeah, yeah we Watermelon Park. No, this was no. over the Shenandoah River. It might have been somewhere. It was a stage built right on the river. Yeah, Watermelon Park. Is that it? Yeah, the Millers. Yeah, I played I played so many times there. Yeah. I never didn't know where it was at because they'd just say, the manager, hey, you got 10 minutes, get on stage. And I'd be <laughs> licking my head. They'd kind of say, aren't you going to comb your hair? And I said, Donna, not nowhere in that contract said I had to be pretty. It said, the six stomens have to be there. I said, I'm a six stomen, so we're up here. So I said, now you fix your hair so you look good. <laughs> but I go worry about it, I'm tired. But anyway, uh, we were going into this Berryville. <clears throat> and there was fiddle, no, that was a watermelon. It's on the hill, on the stage was over there, and, up, and the hill was where all the people sat. That was another place. It wasn't Berryville. Okay. Yes, it was. Uh -huh. I don't know where this other place was with the stage on the water at Shenandoah River. It was Shenandoah, because that's the day that Scott jumped in it off the stage. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hallelujah, brother. And he went off the back of that stage, and we went, <laughs> where did he go? And he went, hallelujah, and he got on top, and Daddy said, well, I'll be doggone. Look at that young, and I don't know what's wrong with him. <laughs> well, what happened? Did, oh, it's Berryville this time. And we pulled up in there in the gate, and there was five or six fiddle players. They'd see Scott coming, and every year he would get it. And Scott tried to be friendly, but he was always saying, Scott would say, now this ain't proper for me to say, but this is what he'd say when he was drinking. He'd throw his fiddle out in the audience or something, and he'd say, anybody says I can't play the son of a bitch. <laughs> he would. And I see Daddy would say, he needs a whooping, that boy. I didn't teach him like that. And I'd say, Scott, how did you get away with that? He said, he said, here I am, girls. Have no fear. Scotty's here. Now, that's how he <laughs> took his music, but he was brilliant with it. He took his music serious, but he was impish, too. But this particular time, that, and this really happened, honey. It really happened. We were going to play in this contest. <clears throat> And Daddy, of course, this is before, way before Daddy passed away. We pulled in the gate, and there was five or six fiddle players there. And Daddy said, now, Scott, 
You know they're going to get you, try to get you drunk today. So don't drink. Don't go around them. Don't drink, he said, because they don't want you to play very good. And Scott said, oh, Dad, Pop, I ain't gonna, I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> they, next thing you know, we got 10, 15 minutes before we went on the stage. We couldn't find Scott nowhere. Scott had disappeared. So we went all over that field, everywhere on that hill, looking for Scott. And Van said, there's a barn across, across that uh, walkway there, up in the hill. And I said, okay, let's go. This, maybe he might be around there. We go in there and he was locked in the barn. They had locked him in the barn, drunk, and took his pants off of him. He had his pants off, he was crawling around with no pants on, and he was real skinny. And I said, Scott, and Van said, Scott, uh, we're getting ready to go on. You gotta go and fiddle. And Scott said, well, I ain't got no branches. I don't know, I'm trying, he's crawling around in this dirt floor. So Van says, I, and Van was big, Van was big and heavy, fat. So he said, I've got an old pair of pants of mine in the trunk of the car. So he said, I'll get them. And he said, but I ain't got a belt. So somebody gave us a rope and Scott put the breeches on and they went like a full skirt, you know. It was gathered around with this rope tied. <laughs> they had taken his pants off and hit them. His fiddle players keep him off the stage. He got up there and he looked like a Humphrey Bogart movie. <laughs> like um, draperies on it for britches. And he was real skinny and that rope a hanging and he got up there and he hollered, Hallelujah, brother! <laughs> <laughs> and he broke down on that fiddle tune and he laid down on the floor and played on his back because that's where he first started doing that. He was too drunk much to stand up. And so oh. he laid on his back and played. <laughs> And they, he won the prize, first anyway. prize. With his breeches looking like a Humphrey Bogart, a bad movie of Humphrey, even though Humphrey Bogart never did anything bad. <laughs> but anyway, he looked like, you know, the old breeches they looked like. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what Scott looked like, only worse with the rope. That's terrible. And no shoes on, no boots, no shoes. That's <laughs> terrible they do that to him to just keep him away from the contest. Yeah, but they knew they they'd lose. found it funny. Yeah, yeah. At yeah, yeah. first we didn't, we thought, oh, that's. That's not good. Right. And Donna was so, I'm humiliated. Oh. You know, and I'm over there giggling. <laughs> <clears throat> Difference in me and Donna. I'm sorry I got this allergy, but I can't help it. Oh, you're it. fine. It's all good. So, so, so like when you're when you're getting your, your, your stage show together, how do you know, like, how do you work with your, like, internal editor? Internal to editor? Yeah, like, that? To, to decide, like, what to keep and what not to do. Like, this is good, that's not good. How do you decide? Well, Scott used to say, everybody has an Arms Blossom special. That means a special tune. So each one of us had a special tune. But when we wanted to do harmony, we never, we had good harmony, but we didn't have the harmony as the bluegrass, like Sonny and Bob Osborne. Now they have harmony. But we had good harmony family type. Mm, but we'd just get up there and we'd just say, Van would take, we'd write it down, hey, I want to do this. Okay, write it down. And he'd put a piece of paper or tape out on his guitar top and we'd just go and do it. You don't, you know, it's like Hollywood. Take some, uh, take some two weeks to do one hour show. And I'm going, duh. Cause, you know. I said, we got to go down tomorrow. I thought we did our part today. <laughs> Right, right. So, so you just you just gauge by the audience what's working. Hey, man. You, first thing, honey, these young people has got to stop playing for their self. They got to start playing for that audience. You don't count. You're out there to entertain that audience, and they come first. Now that's the way we were raised. Daddy taught us that. And he said, no matter how bad of a place it is, no matter how bad, terrible bad, he said, always pretend it's the best auditorium in the world. Like. Uh, you know, up in New York at that big auditorium there. Was it? Uh, Carnegie Hall. Carnegie yeah, Hall. He, yeah, said every, yeah. he said, because you never know what, who's in the audience. He said, and no drinking. He wouldn't let my brothers drink or nothing on the stage. He didn't black, no smoking, no drinking. How many times have I seen him smoke a cigarette and then put it on an amplifier? And there's holes all over the amplifier. That was the old school. But nowadays, you know, some of these young folks, and it's good, to get education, because I believe in it 100% as, as a foundation to your life and to your job. But sometimes you can get overdone. You can get overeducated. And then you, 
you don't know how to communicate with everybody around you. Now that could be, and a lot of the young people are smarter than they ever been. And that's good in a way and bad in another because they don't socialize. Now they have the computers. Then you hear, see everybody sitting there, nobody talks to each other. Nobody laughs, they're too busy doing this or texting or whatever they do. And they don't know what's going on around them. It's really, it's really prevented that, that connection, the, the, the yes. regular... with each other as well with the people. They get on the stage and they, they think they're great. But Daddy used to say, Dad, blame it, no matter how good you are, how good you think you are, somebody's better. They may not have come out of them hills yet, but by golly, they'll be better. That's what he used to tell us. And Scott would say, nobody can beat me, Pop. <laughs> he used to laugh. And he would, he well, he might be right. <laughs> he was aggravating Daddy. And Daddy would go into a big preaching spill, telling us, Dad, blame it. Just because you you get applause this time, ain't your side is going to happen again. That's true. And That's Daddy, true. Oh, yeah. He, he taught us. But you see, honey, I guess a lot of us are different now from the children nowadays. They go and they learn all this music stuff, which is grand. That going, I wish I knew nearer what they know. But I got a kind of an education just like the rest of us Thomans. Ours is, um, our education is doing. And you don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, you know, hoop de doo So I can play a pretty good breakdown, or Scott could play, or Van, or Jimmy, the genius, and Donnie can play a great mandolin. It don't matter. And just get out there and entertain the people with them. That's why you're doing it for. You, when you're first learning, you don't realize you're obsessed with it. You know, learning it and with no music. You hear something and say, well, that sounds awful good. I'll think I'll do it that way. And I'll think, I'm, here's another note I can put into it. You know, and that's what Scott always did, too. And Donna and Jimmy How, and Dan. Some things you just, I guess you just can't, can't learn or you, or you can't <laughs> teach people. Like, stuff like comedic timing. I'll tell you what it is, Pumpkin. Be yourself. Loosen up. Don't let your music run your personality. And don't get to thinking you're so good. I'm good. And I'm just so wonderful. And I didn't like the way he played. And don't criticize everybody. I like to criticize the way they walk or something they said or something they did. But I'm not going to criticize their music unless they really suck. <laughs> if they suck, I'll say, boy, God, you suck. I'll go and tell them. I say, honey, you shouldn't be up there. I will. I've done it a few times. Of course, people don't like it, but... I ain't gonna lie to him, ain't no sense. Daddy, oh, we'd be on the stage playing, and Scott, oh, this is so cute. Scott would say, Pop, this man can sing better than I can. See, Scott wanted to be off the stage so he could kiss the girls. We'd be playing a dance or something. There were some girls, pretty girls, and he wanted to make time with a few of them. And Daddy said, Dad, blame it, Scott. The last time you brought somebody up here, they couldn't do anything. Daddy, and he said, but Daddy, you don't understand. Pop, you don't understand. He would go into this. This is so good, this man. And I knew he was bad, and I would be right along beside Scott. And he said, but Dad, this man is so good. You'll really enjoy him. He'll really do good for the show. He got up there. <laughs> this is down at Hotel Charles in Southern Maryland years ago. Me and Donna was very young. But the guy got up there and he was drunk. And he had his pants unzipped and he had his hands in his pockets and he was saying, Jambalaya. <laughs> and he was awful. And me and Donna got to giggling. And we giggled and we fell on the floor. I was going, I you know, me, I went dramatics. And Daddy said, Dad, blame it, get off the stage. Who said you could sing? He said, of all the musicians out of work, and you get up here, he said, you don't even belong on the stage. Right on the microphone. Oh, my we were, goodness. We were laughing. Daddy was fun. <laughs> we did all kinds of fun things. Those are the memories I miss. <clears throat> what yeah. I didn't like about the music was the traveling. Of course, I had children young. I was married at 16 and started having youngins. And we traveled so harshly. First, it was just any old way you could get there. Just any old way. <clears throat> now, I'd like to play more bluegrass festivals, but they won't let me in. They won't hire me. Why, I don't know. Because I guess I'm silly on the stage. Some people put the word out that I was nasty. I ain't nasty. I just told them about the time I fell in the outhouse. That ain't bad. <laughs> I fell up to here, too. That's why I got a long neck. But I was down in that outhouse, and Mama finally got me out. But that's another story. But I knew then I had 
something going to happen to me in my life. After that, what else is worse? Getting married too young, I guess that would be it. But I did, I do enjoy playing the banjo sometimes, but I don't like to travel so far. And as you know, I'm going to be playing a lot of places. I'm going to England. I'm yeah. not an English gentleman. He is a gent. And I'm a redneck girl. A <laughs> blue brush. I wonder how the old fools are. Well, was, opposite the track, I guess. Yeah. And he's so, well, and then I'm teaching him how to sing bluegrass. Are you? Oh, yeah, but he has that. I was teaching him how to sing when I, I got the Blue Ridge Mountain Blues. Yeah. And he goes, I'll go to Blue Ridge Mountain. And I say, no, you got to say it like this. It's so funny. Oh. So, and he loves me to play. He loves my playing. First time I ever had a husband, and I had a few of them. But uh, first time I had a husband that liked what I did. And the music. Is, is music and... It's got to be fun. Golly, it's got. I would say if I was running the park, I'd give them no more than two microphones. Huh. I said, all right, little darlings, and I get up there. You got two microphones. Get in and out. You can't be hurt if you're not in. But when it comes to a park, get in there. Take that banjo and go like that. Get it over somebody's head and always watch that end of that banjo because you could hit somebody. But get in there, you know. Get out, and that's moving. Somebody is moving at least. What do you think it is that prevents people from having fun? To, to be themselves. They're too jealous over each other. Hmm. But they, they, they don't do anything. They don't get out and... They've been in school. A lot of them, young people have been in school so long. And everything is so uptight. They want to do it just right. And they want to do this so just right. Instead of have fun, it'll turn out all right. And if you mess up, that's part of being great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean... Rolling you know, with it. Mm-hmm. Make it. Making it part of yeah. the show. That's right. I, I always hear mom, mom talk about y'all making the show, and that's what I try to tell you know some of the guys that I play with. It's oh, like, honey, you know, I would like to teach them that. Somebody ordered. Not that I'm so great at it, you but I know how it. we did it. Scott taught us how we did it. How we did it. Yes. We would see how just how much we could get riled up people on the, in the audience. Just to, It was like a contest to us to see how many people we could get doing things. They all loved Scott and they loved Donna. Donna with her pretty babies. She was so beautiful. Donna was so wonderful to me and so pretty. And they're saying, oh, is that old crazy Ronnie? And I didn't mind it. I thought it was funny. And then I, years later, I get Hee Haw. Then I iron. Then the fans of Hee Haw come up. Boy, I sure did like you, but you're not as ugly as a fault. <laughs> and I love it. See, I don't take that serious, no. So there was a little bit of healthy competition. It's like, oh, you try to do this, like trying to rile the crowd up with your with your yeah, brothers and yeah, sisters. Yeah, well, it was fun. It yeah. was fun. So, boy, and then all the guys, the girls would be jealous over Dinah, and I'd zero in on them. We played it, oh, when we were children. All right. Daddy took us over into Washington. We had a job to play. Oh, in Bethesda area, I think to play for a debutante coming out party or a little, it was a country dance. Oh yes, it's a country dance. And daddy said, well, we got a job tomorrow night. We're gonna go play in Bethesda. The young girls are coming out or something. They wanted a little bit of country dance. And Donna had a little feed sack dress mama made her and her hair was blonde and long. And she had them little shoes my brother had paid for them. Made me a feed sack dress. It was so pretty, and I was just learning to play. But I sang good with Daddy, and all the boys there, the girls would sit there, and all the boys were staring at Donna, how pretty she was. These little rich boys, and the girls was, you know, nodding each other and saying nasty things, bad things about her. And it came my turn to sing. We got our turn, and I got up at the microphone. I said, "I've been watching y'all." <laughs> I said, them boys down there liking my sister. And I said, y'all are jealous. I said, remember, we all die in doo-doo. <laughs> Daddy got really mad at me for saying that, but I felt like saying it. In other words, who gives a cotton-picking cat hair, whatever, you know, about what they think. Uh-huh. We were poor. We lived in a one-room shack with a canvas for a roof and when it snowed my daddy made paddles to push it up so the snow would slide off and not come down in on us. Wow. We didn't have a couch and a little coffee tables like other people. We didn't have an upstairs spiral staircase. Didn't have that. 
We had a we had an eating table that Grandpa had set Mama many years ago, and Daddy made chairs and a bench. Do you think that that living like simple that? like that kind of made you free? And maybe more creative too to to have fun to, I don't ma know. to make your own fun. I don't know too many rich people that are creative about anything other than you know being interested in money, which is wonderful. We need them. Like they said, they're going to tax the rich people, you know, and they they were concerned. A lot of factories are closing, but if they tax the rich people, the people like myself and others would not be able to have a place to go to work because we ain't got sense enough to have a company. Give me a break, you know, and put the squirrels. Don't get me on politics, I really don't. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think because there's too many distractions, too many cell phones and texts and internet no, they, and all that the stuff? The music's want to go away. They know. They know electricity. They know how to go loud. And everybody goes. Hey, hey, hey. And you're saying, well, they do know the electric instruments, how to make it go wow. And I told somebody, I said, okay, gang, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm gonna get me a wood, a foot pedal for my banjo and have it go wow yeah, and do foothill special. Go oh, wow yeah, and, and just let it roar or just hit the strings and let it go. Rawr. Then all the kids will like me. I'll be cool, man, and I can dress like Tina Turner. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Oh my gosh. I wanted to do like Tina Turner, dress like her, and do Grandpa Jones's songs. <laughs> They call it ooh, that old Mountain Dew. Ooh, ah, uh, ooh. All this going on, a bunch of girls jumping around, everybody. Then them that refuse it a few. Boom, boom, boom. No, that'd be fun. Here I am, 74 years old, acting like that. Oh, we should do that. That sounds like a fun video. Oh, honey, Can we I do that? To. I wanted to do it. You want to do it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I want to do another one. There's something else that's so fun. <clears throat> I want to do Stand By Your Man All Beat Up. <laughs> that's what I want to do. And the reason I want to do it, and everybody said, well, don't you think that's making it? And I said, are you kidding? I'm the, shoot, I was the general. I was out front. I've been, I've seen that movie, abused. <laughs> you know, so I think it was funny. And have a, all right, in your mind's eye, gang, you got to think of it as a camera. Okay. I got a boot lip, black eye. And I got this lip, and I got my arm in the sling, and I'm limping, and a thing on my neck, you know, that white thing. And I'm singing, sometimes it's hard to be a woman, giving all your love to just one man. He'll have good times, and you'll have all the bad times. You hey, I'm doing things you don't understand. But if you love him, you forgive him. I love him, love him, love him. You know, I think of this stuff. So that's that's like you know taking something. Serious. It's like like you can't you can't take it too. Take it too serious. In a way, when you when you make fun of it, or when you then it's Have like fun with it. Then you that's win it. over it. I tell you, that's you're the first one that ever understood that. All right, I tell you how I come across doing it. Of course, I had that experience of being abused. I did, twice. Pretty bad. Well, two, three times if you talk of verbal abuse. <clears throat> I was only 80 pounds and I got, got whooped a lot, you know? But I, I did. But then you can hear people saying, well, leave them, leave them, leave them, you know? And the woman is usually stuck. I had seven that I was responsible for, seven children, and a daughter with epilepsy. That's Barbara, you met her. <clears throat> and she was a special child. He wouldn't work, wouldn't do nothing. So I took it upon myself to support him. I prayed for God to see fit that I could be funny and uh, entertain the people and use my banjo to do so. If I worked hard, I never did take drugs, I never was a drunk, never did any of that. I was just born squirrely. But I think it's okay because I'm not hurting anybody. I make a few people laugh. But if they don't laugh, I don't care. I hug them anyway. If they don't laugh, you don't like what I said? Okay. <laughs> My darling. Because, <laughs> you know, when, you, when you've been so poor and you've had everything thrown at you, what's there to be afraid of? Afraid of going to hell, so you pray and ask God in Jesus' name to save your soul. 
and you forgive those who've done you bad because you got to be forgiven you got to forgive people in order to be forgiven because god he's a he's going to get on your case that's right <laughs> he's going to sock it to you is, is is music um or is music do you frame it in a spiritual way is it do you, do you think about it like um god given like, Everybody um, uses that word. Oh, it's a God-given <clears throat> talent, but it can be a curse too if you ain't careful. Or, or even like, like when you feel like, um, you know, sometimes when you listen to music and you get the chill bumps, or you get something that, that something that moves through your body. Like it was certain moments when, like, when it just gets so good, or oh, that's cute. Does that does that ever happen? I think I, I, Donna and Scott and Jimmy. I don't know of anybody else that's ever I don't have a hero I wish that I did I don't think I have a hero now I say now that felt her good well there weren't, weren't a lot of role models for like for, mm -hmm. for women coming up in, in no, show business no Bill, Bill Anderson Bill Emerson Bill Emerson came to our house and we lived in that one room shack so did Charlie Waller Scott brought him in there Scott taught Charlie how to play the guitar down wow. in that old dugout basement we had in our house Charlie would come over there and he, Scott would take him downstairs in that old dugout basement. It had a dirt floor. And it had an old bed in the corner where Daddy slept. And Charlie was in high school. He was going to school somewhere in Maryland or Washington. And he'd come over there, sometimes bring a girlfriend, but Scott would work with him down in the basement there on that old bed. And he brought Bill Emerson in one day. And I'm standing there and I had an old pair of Brogan shoes on and a feed sack dress. And Scott told Ma, now that boy can play, he can play real good, and his parents are rich. You know, here we were with a pot of beans on the table and some taters, and here comes Bill Emerson. Nice looking, tall young man. And I said, I play banjo too. And he said, you do? And I said, yeah, Daddy made me a banjo, and I play. I play three finger style too. And he said, you do not. And I said, I do too. He said, you do not because you're a girl. And so I kicked him real hard in the shins. And Mama whooped me with the switch because I kicked Bill Emerson. And I said, I don't care who he is. He ain't going to tell me I can't play because I'm a girl. And he hit him. Right? Did you show him? No, I just kicked him. <laughs> he showed him. <laughs> I showed him. That's the way I showed him. That wasn't nice. And Mama said, you're not to kick anybody that comes in here. I said, Ma, he said I couldn't play, Ma. But mommy, he said I couldn't play. Well, honey, don't pay no attention to him. When they say you can't play, just go ahead and do it. I was, said, but he was yelling and said, you cannot. And I went, come on, God is good. That and was, then, oh, years passed. I'm up at Bucky, Bucky, Maryland. Bucky, Maryland, at the Banjo Institute. They were having a big banjo thing. Your sister was there, Casey. She plays so good. I hate her. But <laughs> and we had to, I had that room with these three or four girls that played banjos. I was sitting over there in my bunk, and I was telling them all tales of woe and funny things of the road. And they just thought I was out of my gourd. You know, <clears throat> they all left the room and went downstairs to gather around. I was up for an award, and I didn't know what that was, but I was up for it, you know. I thought, <clears throat> but I was, went walking down the hall because all the girls left the room, and there was this guy, this mind you of the Big Bang Theory. You see it on television, the Big Bang yeah. Theory? Yeah. This guy come, he was like that tall guy, come walking down the hallway, and he had a gourd banjo. Well, I've seen a few of them, but, you know, it's mostly educated people. I thought, well, here comes a rocket scientist. <laughs> That's what I thought. Well, here comes a rocket scientist. He got that stupid gourd banjo. <laughs> but I walked up to him and I tried to be friendly. And I said, oh, I like your banjo. I said, uh, what is your name? And he wouldn't tell me. And he said, this is my banjo. And I said, well, that's nice. I really like it. I said, it's a pretty, pretty good sized gourd. And it was big, you know, looked like a tater bug, but it was round. I said, I like your banjo. And, and he refused to let me even touch it or look at it. So I said, no. And I went on down. Now, this is the truth. This happened so funny. I went downstairs, and there was this nice-looking young man, tall, nice-looking fella. 
And I walked up to him and I said, hello, how are you doing? He says, I'm doing fine. I'm doing just fine. And it was April and it was a cool breeze coming through that door that was open. And I said, it's a pretty day, but it's a little chilly, isn't it? And he said, yes, it is. And I said, you know, everybody's been telling me about a feller that's here. No, I didn't say feller, excuse me. I said, everybody was telling me about a guy or a girl, a girl by the, I said, a girl by the name of Bella Fleck. I thought it was a girl. I, I promise, gang, with all my heart and soul, I thought Bella Fleck was a girl. I never saw him. I, I heard the name, I thought it was cool. Oh, Bella Fleck is here, and they said, she's so good and I want to hear her. And he turned around and looked down at me. <clears throat> I said, I'd sure like to get to be her friend, cause boy, she's good, I want to learn something from her. And then I said, well, I wrote a poem about Nashville and how crummy, you know, I, I wrote a poem. I do write poetry. And he said, I like that, would you send it to me? And I said, yeah. And he wrote down his address down, Bella Fleck, it was him I was talking to. Now, I felt like stupid. I just looked at him, I said, I'm out of here. And I left. That's a great story. <laughs> Dad, I said, I didn't say a, a boy now, I really didn't. I said, yeah, there's a girl here by the name of Bella Fleck that somebody told me, that, that sounded like a real hillbilly, didn't it? By God, there, there's a girl around here that I really do like to want to hear her. I never heard too many girls play, but I said, they're getting better all the time. Uh -oh. But I want to see this girl that called Bella Fleck. Do you know where she's at? And there he was, it was him. <laughs> I bet he loved it. I bet he tells that story. He just looked. He just looked at me. He was so kind, though, and he was so cute. But he's he's so educated or something. He, yeah. He's, he's got class, though. He's mm. got enough class to cover up his education. <laughs> See, are you these Stoneman? Is that 1923 or 24? Yeah, right here. 1924. You see this? The sinking of the Titanic. Yeah. E.V. Stoneman. Okay. Yeah. Once you see that. Yeah. See? A lot of. Here it is, the first, first million seller. Mm-hmm. Oh, you, you get it on me, you brat. I just want to get it off, okay? Now, so, you get brat. <laughs> Cute. All right, and then I'm going to show you this. And we got these, you can take a picture of all of these we do have of daddies. Now, there was somebody recording on Cylinder way before daddy, or before daddy, but it was popular music. Now, Vernon Galhart, he was a pop singer, and then he, he he was a friend of Daddy's, Vernon Galhart. You know how your pickers get together and are friends? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Vernon Galhart was a blind man. Uh-huh. And Daddy got to know him quite well and admired him. And But he he heard Daddy and all the other people that began, started recording country, and his and it was selling so good that Ern Vernon Dalhart started going into country or coming into this type of music. Before that, he was a pop singer. So, Interesting. He saw what was, he where it was going. He knew what was going. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, his managers or whoever did. Now, I'm going to show you something in this. I've got to take this off in order to show you. You get your phone ready. This is called a governor. Right here, now you see I'll do this. That mm. makes it go around. You see that? Yeah. And you see if I take this off, listen to this. So you gotta go. But this thing is the most expensive thing on this whole deal. You see that one? And then I'll cut it off. Yeah. I wanted you to see this. Very interesting. Never seen one up close. Yeah, it's good.